Hello again, and I'm wearing the same shirt as yesterday, but a little bit of different commentary, bringing you game of the day for round seven of this fantastic event on chess.com. And the game I'm bringing you is a match between China and Europe on VE Day. If you know your history, then lots of people have been celebrating this around England, which is Victory in Europe Day uh, due to the World War unfortunate events there and therefore Duda you must think is favorite in this game but let's see what happens we have the very strong Yu Yang Yi of China against Duda the game starts with the Nimzo Indian and many lines being played here we saw Bishop d2 in one of my previous videos but Yu Yang Yi just plays the very sensible e3 move and this is a way to try and bring out the bishop and knight quite quickly on those squares. Black castles, and now the other idea behind this, knight e2, protecting his brother in arms on c3. And one of the main ideas black has in the Nimzo is to take on c3, but now white can simply recapture with the knight and gain the bishop pair, not damaging his pawn structure. And I think this is actually a very good line in the Nimzo that white can play. And white plays some very unique ideas in this game. Black played rook e8, and the idea of this is to give the bishop a very safe square in f8, not giving up the bishop pair. Now white needs to get this knight out of the way to develop the bishop, and knight g3 is not a square I'm used to. It normally goes to f4, uh, but as we see, this knight becomes a real killer piece. d5. And now bishop to e2, developing, b6, and white castles kingside, bishop b7, and now a nice move, I feel, pawn takes d5. It's not normally a good idea to give up the tension, but it is if you've got a particular idea in mind. And this is where we can see very clever middle game ideas and plans developing. After black recaptures, white plays what we call the minority attack. The minority attack is when you, you use your pawn minority. So in this case, the two little guys over here against these three pawns of blacks. And you, you try to use your two pawns to either stop your enemy's majority from moving or create weaknesses over there. And I like this move B4 because it kind of holds up both of black's breaks, mainly C5. If c5 has ever played uh, white can capture twice on that square and this pawn on d5 is now what we call an isolated pawn a weak pawn there so black continues its development and now queen b3 increasing a bit of pressure over there and stopping c5 because now b takes c5 and the bishop is on pre pawn to c6 and now a very clever idea in this position We've done the minority attack, and now we've got to think where we have the majority of pawns. And you often want to base your plan on where your pawns have the biggest mass. And you can see in this position, white has this lovely mass of five pawns, and black is kind of missing a pawn. So the next idea, again, an idea I haven't seen in this particular line, F3, preparing to use that mass with E4, I really like, and even though the computer gives this as roughly even, uh, I, I don't know really know where black goes wrong. And one thing I've always found, if you can't find the mistake in the game, it normally means it's a brilliant game, because often one side makes a mistake, clearly. A famous chess player once said it was the last person to blunder who loses the game. It's not through great play, it's through blundering. Uh, but in this position, it's not clear where black went wrong. I, I mean, it, it really isn't. If we look at black's pieces, though, we can see, especially this bishop on b7, is really bad looking at those pawns, and they never find any activity, but soon white's pieces do. Black tries to go a5, and the point is to get the open a file. White just defends against that one. And now b5. Now, this is a quite controversial decision because now the bishop on b7 is always going to be bad on that square because you can never play c5. But black's idea is logical, and this is one way that black often meets the minority attack in these positions. He wants to get a good hold on c4 and bring that knight into that square. It's worth remembering this idea. 
but many downsides. The pawn on c6 is just one pawn, which is now completely dead. Uh, it, it can never move. White continues with his central advance, and now after knight b6, e5, things are really getting quite bad. After white plays f4, this position looks pretty terrible. These two pawns are, are horrendously strong, motoring down the board to rip open the black king. And knight c4 continues black's idea, and now just a little safety first move, tucking the king away. And these little moves, you often see high-level chess players playing this because when the position does open up and become tactical, you might save some tempo in the future with your king being on a safer square. So it's kind of Petrosian-like. Petrosian, ex-world champion, used to play these safety first moves. Safety before the position erupts like a volcano. Queen b6, and now queen b1 defending and bringing the queen over to where we're going to start the attack. We want to start the attack on the king side as white because, again, that's where we have our pawns and our knight here, as I said, has a great future diving in. Black's pieces don't have any good squares here and the next move just demonstrates that. Black plays knight to b8, trying to get some counterplay against b4, but if you're in a race in a game of chess where one side is attacking and trying to win a pawn on the queen side and the other player is trying to checkmate, Obviously, the checkmate idea is a little bit more scary because you know what? Checkmate ends the game. So, you know what White does? He goes for checkmate. F5. Dangerous Freddy the F-pawn. Black has to try and at least win a pawn. And now White eliminates that strong knight and zooms his queen in to the king side. And really, the pressure is mounting. He could have also moved the queen to h5 here, which is another strong idea, with the idea of bringing a knight quickly into g5, which would create devastating threats against both h7 and f7. But queen g4 is so tempting, where white is trying to find another target, in this case, g7. Black plays rook on e to d8, attacking, and now bishop e3. There's no point giving away pawns for free. And black decides it's time to take on b4. But this is just too slow. Yu Yang Yi, very dangerous attacking player, as he demonstrates with some force in this game. Now, here, if you ever get a position like this, when you're attacking, one good little tip to know if the attack's going to work is to simply count up your attacking pieces or units and then count up your opponent's defensive units. If you have two or more attacking, is most likely you're going to force a breakthrough. And here White has the queen, the knight, and potentially the bishop with a pawn there. So four attacking units. And black only really has the bishop, and you could say this pawn defending. So it's really looking grim there. You can just do the simple mathematical thing to work out how it's working. And now... Rook takes b4, Boar! shoving that on the board. And this is now forcing, well, I say forcing, but it looks like it should be forcing bishop takes b4. But of course, there's a devastating way through here because now black is weakening g7. And white could just go bishop to h6, threatening mate. Two ways to defend. If bishop to f8, we break through by taking on g7. And then bringing in another attacking unit. Clearly the position is dropping. And if g6 in this position, a very nice move. This pawn structure is just about holding up until we either play e6, which is one strong way, or we weaken it first and then bring in yet another attacking unit because there's a square there which is going to force checkmate with the queen coming along here. There's no way black can defend such a position as this. For example, rook takes here. And now, well, you guys can look at this position. Calculation is key, but there are a number of tempting ways here that white can break through. I'll give you a little clue. Queen h4, getting on that file, is one. So after rook takes b4, black tries rook to a3, desperately attempting something. But now white just brings all his pieces in. Knight on g to e4. A very nice square there. And also defending. 
Black, again, can't ever take the Rook because G7 is too weak. So Duda tries taking on C3 and taking on B4. But now it's the end. My only friend, the end. I had to throw a little bit of Jimmy Morrison in there, you know. One of the best poets of our generation, they say. Not really our generation anymore. Just like going on a little bit of a tangent now and again. So, Bishop h6, here we go. And again, if black tries to defend here, we can break through. And can you see the breakthrough here? Pause the video if you need to. I won't give you any clues here, but you can use our good friend here at the right moment. So, g6 played, and white opens up the position, opens up the rook. And now, this other move we mentioned, these pawns are very fragile now. And after this brilliant move, e6... They are really ready to crack like a nice juicy egg for breakfast. And the yolk is that king on g8. And another thing we should notice here, all the black's pieces on the wrong side of the board. There's no way you can defend against this plus three attack. White has three pieces plus a pawn attacking on the king side. Again, simple addition will show us that it's indefensible. Black tries, queen takes d4, and the final piece comes in. Great harmony with the white pieces. This knight has chances to come to f6. Black can never get rid of the e-pawn because that is a devastating check. And if you try something along this line, well, one nice move here is bring the knight even closer with multiple checkmate ideas on these two squares, and black simply can't defend this one. So the queen goes to d3 with a little cheeky threat there. You never know if white doesn't do anything, it will be the end. But one thing, another little tip, when you're attacking viciously, you should always watch out for tempo gains. Timing is so important here. And white here should be now looking at ways to force the win with checks as he does in a beautiful way. Pawn takes f7, check. And now king to h7. If the king goes to h8, well, have a little think about this. It's a pretty grim position here. And again, you can try to discuss this yourself. Just watch out for that move there. One way you can do it is even the very quiet move, queen to f4. Because now you're threatening to come into g7, come into e5, and this pawn on f7 is a killer. It's no better after king h7, though, because knight g5 is a devastating check. If the king takes it, it's checkmate with queen h4 and this very nice knight e6 checkmate. And after king h8, bishop g7 is a beautiful way to finish the game. Really powerful play from you, Yang Yi. And if the king takes that one, well, now the knight comes to this square. The king has to go to the h-file and we can just move over, stepping into checkmate. Very powerful play there from the ever-dangerous Yu Yang Yi. Duda seemed to get in quite a bad opening middle game position there. And this idea of playing F3 and E5 I thought was very clever. And the way that White won this game was with his skeleton, which is the pawns. He first uses his minority attack to paralyze his opponent's pawns on the queen side. And then he uses his majority attack to develop a vicious, vicious win. Do like this video. Do subscribe to the Chess.com YouTube channel. It's all good stuff that's posted here. Hopefully help you improve. And let's wait for some more exciting rounds in this brilliant competition. See you later, guys. Goodbye for now.